Hey everyone, it's Terry with Terry's Tidbits. We just wrapped up week 10 of the Sales Cloud Consultant Study Group. And this video talks about consulting practices. So uh, use cases, and it, it's, it's kind of an interesting one to try to know how to study. Um, it, we've had some use cases that we talked through. Those are always fun to do. And then we talked about project lifecycle, which we had a kind of an ex expert that does <laughs> uh, project lifecycle stuff for her job. So she spoke on that topic, did a fantastic job. Um, we also then started on, I was trying to think where, what we did. <laughs> um, we also started on some of the sales metrics reports and dashboards. So um, I hope you're following along and you're finding these videos helpful. Let's jump into the study group. So this is our 10th week of the study group and we're talking today about consulting practices and we're starting on the sales metrics, so reports and dashboards. And our pres presenters are here. Meredith, you are our first one uh, talking about use cases for consulting practices. So I'll let you take it. And All right. Um, the first one, I'm looking through my slides and it shows the answer. So, oh, wait, I got it. Okay, we're good. Okay, everyone see the screen? Looks good. All right. So Mike Johnson is a chief revenue officer challenged with driving the company and in breaking into new markets. He wants to ensure that leads and accounts are distributed efficiently so sales reps are more likely to meet their quota. What tool would you recommend? You got to call on people. Um, a or brand. Okay, so this might be kind of a silly question. Are you talking like... Oh, wait, never mind. Uh, I know the answer to that. And I'm really hoping with this one, some of these, I might have an idea of the answer, but it could be several because I think like that's the beauty of this exam is there's a lot of different features that you could recommend. I'm going to go, to me, I think there's two answers maybe. Sure. So yeah. I might need to, to define tool a little bit better. I'm thinking like lead assignment rules or territories, but territory seems more complex than lead assignment rules. But would lead assignment rules be considered a, a tool like territory management would be? I use tool like just generic in a okay. generic way, like feature. Okay. To me, a key word in this is to meet their quota. That's That's an interesting addition to this question. I don't know if that was intentional, Meredith, or not, but... I don't know. So I'll give what I thought was the answer. I just totally made these up, so... Okay. Yeah. Territory management. Yep. So the idea is you have all of these sales reps, and you don't just want to give them one zip code. Everybody gets one zip code, right? You want to make sure that you're looking at data and ensuring that it's distributed efficiently so that you can make the most of each territory or area that you assign. And so with that, if you don't have any of that data to tell you um, maybe like the projected revenue or the historical opportunities in that uh, territory previously, then you're just guessing and you could be missing out and you could put four reps in that territory and make even more revenue versus just assigning one because that sales rep won't even have time to call on all those people. But I get where you were going with it, Abranda, with the lead assignment because I said distributed. So maybe you were thinking that's the function to distribute. Mm -hmm. Also, the word efficiently as well. Um, 
together with distributor. I'm the SR person, so when I read, I read, <laughs> I read very differently. <laughs> so that's what I also, but I thought about using, uh, like my choice was tertiary management, but then um, I also see why uh, web to lead assignment. I mean, the, the assignment would be another two. I didn't catch what you said there at the end, um, Pearl. Huh? Can you say that again? Oh, because I saw the words distributed efficiently. Distributed. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, because my my limited understanding about tertiary management is about being fair, right? Uh, so that's why we as as aside by tertiary with other variables to make sure um the reps have the equal opportunity. Um, that's my limited understanding about TM is being uh TM is being used. Um, but when I see the words distributed efficiently, then I would think about yeah. automation, um, uh, automated um, assignment to route the lead to the appropriate sure. available yeah. AE or something and I, like that. Yeah, and I would, I would suggest that territory management isn't necessarily about being fair. I, okay. I don't think I would think about it in that term. I would, it's really, it's, it's, it's about how you're assigning accounts to different groups of people. Um, I mean, you could have you could have multiple people and uh, representing multiple salespeople in the same territory. Um, and so you it, it really isn't necessarily about a fairness aspect of making sure one territory is equal to another. Uh, you you might have reasons to do that, but it, I don't know that that's necessarily the primary reason. Okay, thank you. Good, good, sure. good conversation though. Good. Yeah. All right. Claire Simpson is a CEO for a manufacturing company. She is tasked with reviewing budgets and approving plans for how many widgets to produce. Her company is already using sales cloud opportunities to review pipeline, but wishes to predict the likelihood of closing those opportunities by stage. What tool would you recommend? Path. What was that, Pearl? Path. Ta path? Path. 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 Okay. So you're trying to predict. You're, yeah, you're trying to predict the likelihood of closing. Yeah. Um, Einstein. That would be a good one. Oh, that's a thought. I, I didn't had, even I didn't, think of I that. didn't think about Einstein in there, but yeah, it'd be a tool for sure. We got several in the chat window. Saying oh, and I'm forecasts. not. If you could read those, I'm not following the. Everybody's chat. saying uh, forecasting. Okay. Yes. I would say that too. And then I would also say they should be using manufacturing cloud. Um. <laughs> yeah, that's on my list, Terry. On the camp. I got that's not going to be on the exam, but they should be using manufacturing cloud. <laughs> Can I fix? Oh, shoot. Okay. I guess I just missed my numbers. This is actually question three. Okay. <laughs> The sales ops team at Big Cloud Computing is reviewing metrics and found that 75% of accounts are opened by an inside sales rep. Upon further analysis, they found that accounts that had a relationship with an outside sales rep brought in 40% more revenue than accounts with an inside sales rep alone. What sales cloud features would you recommend to ensure cross-collaboration between teams so the company continues to grow revenue. You can steal some of these, Terry, by the way. I might. I think they're pretty good. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Carolyn? I'm not seeing the chat, so I'm just calling on people whose faces it, I see. Nobody's <laughs> answered this one yet, so I think you've okay. stumped them, evidently. <laughs> So, I mean, collaborative forecasting, but 
that's sort of mm, no. So if um, you have inside sales and outside sales and you want to encourage them to work together. How about chatter? There you go. <laughs> chatter is what I was thinking. I, I said account teams and chatter. Oh, account teams and chatter. Yeah. Oh, that's a good thought too. Account teams. I didn't think about that. Yeah. Right. That was my first thought was account teams. And then I went to chatter, but. Oh yeah. And, and opportunity teams and splits. Sure. Yeah. Mm. I like the chatter one. And then the, another thing I saw in the exam guide was Slack. So yeah. Slack. Oh, yeah. That's what my thought it would be. Okay. The, and what's the primary difference between using chatter versus Slack? Want me to go or anyone else? Anybody? The extra cost. <laughs> uh, good, good call. Good point. That's a good one. <laughs> Chatter is centered around Salesforce record, whereas there Slack is, is just an instant messaging tool that you can use for anything. That's exactly what I was looking for. Thanks, Brenda. Perfect. Yep. All right. <clears throat> Daniel Kim is a sales leader tasked with leading the charge as a subject matter expert for the sales cloud project. He shared that while he believes his reps would benefit from reviewing Salesforce to prep for calls, they spend the majority of their day in email or on the road. Salesforce will be a big change, and he's concerned that implementing Sales Cloud will add an administrative burden to his reps. As a Sales Cloud consultant, what tools might you recommend to save his reps time so they can spend more of their, their day selling? It's a tough one. <laughs> You've got Salesforce Mobile, Mobile, and all those coming through chat. Okay, that's good. So I read about yes. Einstein activity capture, which I've never used, but I, I hear this complaint all of the time. I want my rep selling, not logging activities. Yeah. Um, so, good call out. Yeah, so Einstein activity capture, they're already sending emails, they're already scheduling meetings, it automatically logs that on the record. And then when they email someone new, it automatically creates a contact. Yeah. So when I, when I, as you were reading through your scenario, uh, the key thing there that stuck out to me was they spend the majority of their day in email and on the road. And if it's on the road, it's almost always going to be mobile. Um, email, that was, I, I missed that keyword, but when I see Einstein activity capture, that makes sense. Um, yeah. Very good. Yeah, you, Terry, as a question writer, I, I'm realizing when you write the questions, it's a lot easier to go from the answer and then go back into the question than if you're it on the other is. end. It is. Yeah. And I love the fact that you got all scenario based because I, I sometimes cheat and just say, I, I, I just try to get, do you know the answer <laughs> on some of my questions and forget about doing this scenario? Because if you know the answer, you can hopefully apply it to a scenario when you need to. But this is good. Very, very nicely done. All right. I think this is my last one. So Birds and Blooms had a record. No, two more. Birds and Blooms had a record breaking year in sales. And due to this, they received funding to expand operations outside the U.S. Mm -hmm. To support this growth, they need to quadruple the sales team. Mm -hmm. And with this, ensure sales users follow consistent processes for outreach and other sales activities. For reporting purposes, the company will need to manage dated exchange rates. What features should a sales cloud consultant consider? We've got Caroline with currency. Yep. What, just out of curiosity, take take that scenario and the fact that you've got a company that's growing that significantly. And what in general are some thoughts that you would have as, as a consultant for that group? Take the the exchange rate part out of that mix. 
And you just just the fact that you're you're working with a team that's needing to quadruple their size of salespeople. What would you what would you walk in at looking for? What are some of the, the key pieces there that you want to make sure they have in place? Multi-currency. Way to try and answer all together, you would need to look at um, the business processes and any changes to business processes with net new mm -hmm. uh, lines of business that are there, and then aligning new business processes to uh, expansion, whether that be in a different country or whatever, with different record types and those kinds of things um, um, as you go through it potentially. Yeah, what are some things that you could do to help with the onboarding of new people? when you think about opportunities. You have guidance. Guidance. Good job, Pearl. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. I love it. So that's, I'm so glad we do the conversation because you all caught things I didn't even think of. So multiple currencies. Oh, sales cadence is good. There's a tool called sales cadence. Yeah. And that's where you say like, if a customer has this criteria, you know, a phone call needs to happen first, wait two days, then we need to do a follow-up email. Um, and then the other thing was, and I forgot to add it, was advanced currency management is the one that lets you manage dated exchange rates. Dated, yeah. So you have to turn on the multiple currencies and then do the advanced. Now is, is sales cadence, is that what they used to call the velocity? Is it velocity? It's a feature um, within that velocity. So velocity okay. was that console with all those smart features. Okay. And this was week one. I presented on this one. Okay, great. Oh, yeah, you did. I do remember that now. Okay. Yeah. I think I have one more. Um, and what was the one that you said, Pearl, on the last Guidance. one? Guidance. 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 Yeah. 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 Okay. Jessica Stone is an inside sales rep calling on a large book of business. Due to this, she sometimes forgets the name of who she spoke with and how they impact decision making. She has a weekly meeting. She has weekly meetings with her sales team, and she would like to leverage their existing relationships to help close deals. What Salesforce features would you recommend? Activities. Mm -hmm. Um, this is good. Contact roles was added to the chat. Activity logging. So I'll give a hint. So she's in these sales meetings and just picture yourself, you're in this meeting and you're in a table and you have all these different sales reps around and you want to talk to them about who you have met with and their impact on decision making. What tools would you recommend to kind of facilitate that conversation? There's a really simple one there that I think we're missing. Yeah. That we probably use every day in Salesforce. And <laughs> Danielle's laughing. I'm laughing, but I also don't know the answer. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> every day, and I'm you, you can make really pretty uh, pictures too on on another section of Salesforce. <laughs> <laughs> So report, like reports and reporting? Reports, reports and okay. dashboards, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other one is, you know, so she she logs these activities, but she forgets who she spoke with and how they impact decision making. So that's... So what's the who? How do we log the who in Salesforce? Contact. Oh, contacts. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And then what they do, if you have all these different contacts. 
Contact rules. That's yes. Contact rules. I already yes. said that. So yeah. oh, you did. Yeah, that okay. one was in Perfect. the chat. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, and I put opportunity teams and opportunity contact roles. And with that report, you can pull a report of that. Uh, thank you. Sure. All right. I think that is the last one. I wish I had more time. I wish I would have done more, but, you know, sometimes it's, you just got to let it go. It sometimes takes a long time to write a good question, which is why Those some of my questions though. aren't good. <laughs> I really enjoyed doing that. It is yeah. fun to do them. Yeah. Awesome. Nice job. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Danielle, I have you with Project Lifecycle. Yeah. So hopefully I'm um hopefully I'm presenting this in a way that makes sense for you all. <laughs> um, this is the one you said it's your bread and butter. What what you do, right? Right. right. This is what I do all day long. So I'm like, Yay. It's okay and helpful. And, and if there's additional questions or anything that you guys have, I could go back and get more information. Um, as I went through the trailheads and things, I didn't find anything specific to this. So this is, I'm totally pulling this out of what I do every day. Great. Um, and so here's kind of the project life cycle that I have. And we, you, you guys have this slide or a couple slides available to you here. Um, but basically you start with kind of the initiate phase where you've got your project going on, you've got your definition, you go through your um, statement of work, you put your delivery teams together, um, and that based on the the project that you've got going on and like how you're how you're planning to kick everything off, um, you'll go through your discovery agenda items, you'll put your planned sessions in place um, so that you can kind of go into the next phase or the main phase, which is discovery. And so from a discovery perspective, um, you're actually sitting down with all of your key stakeholders within your project business um, and going through, you've got interview questions that you're doing, you're going through design workshops, you're going through um, business process, um, design information, um, just kind of processing out what the current state is, what they'd like that future state to be, um, and being able to figure out exactly what it is that um, that you guys are going to try and build out within the system itself and find any processes that might be broken today or need improvement and find ways to improve that particular piece. Um, from there, you start um, the initial backlog, which is your um, user stories. And um, we I typically say that you don't kick off and start a project until you have at least two to three sprints worth of um, of work to be able to do like fully to find out. So that's um, when you, when you think through a, a user story and I, I don't know if we've got, went through user stories in a different section or not, I apologize because I have not attended as much. Um, but the user story is kind of the, who, who is this that's doing it from a persona perspective? Um, what is the, the task that they're looking to do? What's the benefit of why they're going to do that? And then the acceptance criteria that goes along with that. That means that if you build something and it hits those acceptance criteria, then that is considered to be a quote unquote done story. And so you put an initial backlog in place of that. Then you kind of put a release plan together that talks about all of your different epics and features, um, that would go along with the, a project that you've got in place for that particular time. And then you also put a DevOps strategy um, together and in place. And so DevOps strategy, really making sure that you understand um, the different environments that you're in, how you're going to push um, changes from one environment to another, whether you're using some sort of um, tool like GitHub or um, we, they've got a DevOps tool now in Salesforce that you can use that for, or if you're just using um, managing just change sets or however it is that you're pushing that information up there. So kind of discovering the why you would do something and then defining how you would actually complete that um, happens in the discovery phase. Any questions on either of those two phases before I move on? And is this oh. the kind of information that you're looking at from a project life cycle perspective? Can I ask a question? That's a good um, <laughs> When do you put re um, requirement in the discovery phases? Um, yep. So that that's when you when you go through discovery, you're creating your user stories, which are the technically the requirements. Okay. Um, so the re, again, those requirements would be, um, you know, maybe you have a sales persona, you might have a sales manager persona, and so as a salesperson, I need to be able to track my opportunities so that I can. Um, 
you know, keep my opportunities up to date and know where they are within each stage so I can better the business. And then you would have acceptance criteria that would go along with that from a requirements perspective. And that's kind of like the agile process that Salesforce kind of totes to be like the way that you develop Salesforce software these days. There are some other areas that you could do it with. Um, There's, you know, those fixed fee kinds of things where you define absolutely everything out. That's called a waterfall approach um, where you define absolutely everything out and then you take those people away, go back and build. It's not as efficient typically um, when you do it that way. So this is the way that that Salesforce kind of tells you to do it is going through this like agile process, if that makes sense. Thank you. So you'll go through that discovery process and that's when you start going into sprints. And so in sprints, there's four um, very kind of distinct areas here. You go through that planning phase. So you decide when you're working with a product owner or your client, um, hey, here are the particular items that we're going to bring into sprint. Here's how many people we have to be able to build these particular items and um, determine within a certain amount of time frame. It's typically about two weeks, but sometimes people vary. Uh, When you go from there, um, these, the, you you say, okay, I think that I can get this amount of uh, stuff done in this amount of time. Um, a lot of the the ways that people kind of determine how much work they can get done is by pointing and doing story pointing or what they call poker, um, where you can kind of go through and say, all right, I think this story is going to be fairly simple. And so it might be a one or or a two. Um, and then you might have a a piece of work that is a little bit larger and you might end up being an eight. And so every agile team is a little bit different on how they point their things. Um, typically in in the projects that I run, we go through the Fibonacci sequence, which is one, two, three, eight, and 13, and then 24 and above is like crazy. And you should be breaking those down into things. Um, and then from there, Um, you know, you kind of say, okay, well, if it's a one, then that equates to like, you know, somewhere between a half an hour to an hour's worth of work. And you might have something that would be an eight, that would be a full, a full week's work of worth or 40 hours worth of work for a dev person to actually complete. And so that way you can kind of help plan through, um, what's going to actually end up going into that sprint and make sure that all of the things that are in that sprint are attainable for you to be able to, to finish in that time frame that you've allotted for what you're what it, what you're calling your sprint. From there, um, you kind of go into a the, the actual building portion of things where um, you build things out. You um, are sending those over to a QA person, a quality assurance person, to make sure that yes, this particular item as a dev person or an admin person, I built this. It matches the criteria. They go back through their test scripts and say, yes, as a user, when I do this, these all these things happen. I've ticked off that every single one of these acceptance criteria work. And then from there, um, you take that in and actually show the client for review. Uh, And this is where you can can, you get feedback. So you actually demo out what that looks like um, to the particular uh, stakeholders. And then they say, yes, I do like this, or, oh, that's not really what I was had in mind. Um, you know, maybe we need to iterate on this a little bit. And so that's when you start putting some additional um, stories in place that, are, that would be called enhancements um, that kind of make it so, so you can iterate on your, on your product and make it better and better. Um, and this is a kind of a better approach. And this is why Salesforce um, puts this approach out there is, if you're going to fail, fail fast and quick, make sure that you know exactly what it is that you want, um, as opposed to getting all of those requirements, you know, going away for a couple of months, building all of this stuff out, not getting any input or information from the actual users themselves. And then you um, come back and whatever it is you've built, they're like, they hate it, right? Um, so this is just making sure that you continue to get feedback from your um, your stakeholders and users so that you know that they're actually going to end up using your tool. Um, from there, they go into kind of a UA, UAT. Well, I guess from that, um, we, we continue to have a solution to feature backlog. So I talked about the initial backlog, having a couple of sprints worth of stories available to you, and you continue to add on to that 
Um, with prioritization, as you're planning, you go and prioritize things up. So maybe when you plan something out and you had a release plan originally, um, that thing that might change because they might end up pulling a story in because they want an enhancement or something built differently than what you originally thought that you were going to. And so that would deprioritize another particular item um, in order to make it so that it fits into that, again, that that couple of weeks worth of work that you would be putting in place for that. Um, you obviously have your user interface um, developed in some way, shape, or form, which would be Salesforce and any customizations that may or may not happen with that. Um, and then your test plans. Um, and those test plans kind of feed into the validate form. But I'm going to stop there because that was a lot um, that happens in kind of that build phase and that cycle that repeats over and over again, sometimes for a couple of sprints. Sometimes for, I mean, I've had a project that I'm um, 16 months in and uh, we're 30 sprints in. Um, so we've been doing this literally 30 times, right? Trying to get, turn things out. And we've been slowly releasing pieces by pieces um, as we've kind of gone through. So I'll stop there. And does anyone have any questions before I go into that kind of validate and enable um, timeframe? Everyone's pretty clear? Yep. Okay. So then from there, um, you'll do what is UAT or user acceptance testing. So you've had a, a group of people you've been working with, the product owner and some of the, the key business stakeholders that have been part of your project team that you've been gathering requirements from and doing demos for from a client review perspective. Um, this opens us up to a more trusted group of users. Typically, we call these people champions. Um, within the ecosystem who are coming in and doing some user acceptance testing, making sure that they really like the system. They might be a SME. They, they might also um, be a manager or someone who's going to be a super user who's going to help all the other users as we kind of um, release all this information out and go through an adoption perspective. Um, that's what these people help with. So you'll have a kickoff typically where you bring all those people in, make sure that they um, have access to the system. And then some of those test plan, testing plans that we um, brought from the build perspective actually ends up going into user acceptance testing test scripts, meaning that this is, I'm gonna go as a salesperson and I'm gonna do these 10 activities and it will tell you step-by-step step how to do those particular activities. And as you're going through those activities, um, they can pass it or fail it depending on if it's worked, if it's working or not working based on how it's supposed to um, function and the requirements that were put in place. Um, here is kind of where you have a lot of additional enhancements or bugs that might come through that you have to prioritize with the business. Um, it could be something that they would, oh, well, I see that it does this way and this is technically hitting the requirement, but wow, it would be a lot easier if it, you know, if we moved it on the on the page layout somewhere, as an example, or it might be a little bit easier if this was a drop down pick list as opposed to a free form typing, um, and so they 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 might put that in as an enhancement potentially, or it could be something that just doesn't work. And everybody in the software development world, sometimes things just don't aren't perfect, right? Like people are perfect. There's human errors. So as you're deploying something up or you're going through with something, sometimes things just don't work. And so that's considered a bug. Um, and that gets pushed back into the development team to go and be prioritized and fixed from a um, from a, a project planning perspective. So we kind of go through, um, typically a lot of this is done on site. It's significantly easier if you're like on site in a room with people as they're going through this so that you can very quickly answer questions. Sometimes the the what they consider a bug or enhancement, they just don't necessarily know or understand. So there's training opportunity where you can kind of go through and work through with their teams. Um, so out of this, there comes the issue log um, that comes out. Um, again, there could be some prioritization backlogs that are happening here. Um, but overall, you're looking for user acceptance sign off at the end of it, which means that all of the items in the test scripts have officially passed um, and nothing is failing anymore. And the, the people who have gone through and tested everything um, say, yep, yeah, this is good to go based on what you gave us to, to go through and test. And we're happy with moving forward with this. From there, um, now your your system is ready to go in, in one of your upper environments. Um, typically this is happening and they actually call it a UAT environment. Um, normally you have a dev, you have a QA, 
uh, you have a UAT and then you've got your production environments. Depending on how large the organization is, sometimes you have multiple of those different kinds, depending, um, that are going through. And um, from there, you'll, you'll you'll work with a trainer to do a training plan. And depending on how that training goes, you might have decks, you might have videos, um, you might have in-person trainings where you're actually going through and training all the end users um, in order to make sure that you have a... Um, a, a good understanding of how the system or the features and functionality pieces are going to work and that they all feel comfortable and good with that. After training and all the training materials are done, um, you go through a go live planning um, kind of exercise, making sure that you have all of your ticks and tacks of if there's integrations that are happening in place, you're um, clearing out any environments that you need to clear out, just making sure everything is like good and ready to go. And then, um, you go to production at that point and that's deploying all of the um, configuration and code from that UAT environment up into the prod environment. And then you're just good to go. And nothing ever happens there, I promise. It's all, and there's never an issue when you go to production. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so then that's, that's also part of that kind of planning um, and deployment is, hey, what happens if something is wrong, something doesn't work that wasn't uh, foreseen? Um, you know, how do we roll back uh, in order to make sure, especially if it's in a live environment um, and we're adding new features because it's not the first release, but, uh, you know, subsequent releases from there, uh, making sure that that you have a rollback plan if you need to as you're cutting things over from one to another. And then from a project perspective, um, after all of that is done and complete, you kind of go through a project closeout um, with project acceptance from um, whoever your stakeholders are. Any questions on that kind of life cycle? And I can go into a couple of the key people who are driving this as kind of a next step. A lot of good information. All right. I'm going to go into the next one then, and I can always come back to this. So kind of some important key project roles that are here, the product owner. Um, product owner sits on the client side. Um, they are, it is one person. It is uh, one person to um, praise or strangle a throat of. <laughs> is a one decision maker. They're the ones who are kind of running point for you any and all times. And they're trying to make sure that you, they are basically blocking, tackling, and making sure that they're getting the appropriate decisions um, from all of the other business SMEs that are out there in the room. Typically, um, this person is dedicated to the project half time or more. Um, again, depending on the size of the project, but most of the time they're they're spending about half their actual like work time um owning this particular uh business portion or piece um they're empowered by the organization and can engage all the different SMEs and stakeholders appropriate uh, when appropriate for those per particular people to come in um they are the ones who are prioritizing the stories at the end of the day so as we sit and go through the backlog, um, as you're going through sprint planning, they're the ones that are kind of making that final decision to say um, this user story and this functionality is more important or prioritized to the business than this other particular piece or portion. So they're actually physically like going in and prioritizing that information with the project team. Um, these people are also uh, the person who is writing user stories. Depending on, on the situation, um, sometimes the, the business analyst writes the user stories and then the product owner accepts them. Um, from a consulting perspective, I will say it's very rare that I find a product owner who can write all of their own user stories, um, but it is preferred and they absolutely have to approve them. So they are reading every single user story that's in there. They're agreeing that all the acceptance criteria that is in that user story um, is accurate and that if said user story is built and match and and matches up to that acceptance criteria that that would be considered done um, from the build project team and that anything outside of that would end up being an enhancement or a new story that would come in um, from that perspective. And then finally, um, oh, I guess not finally. I have a question, so Danielle. Um, so on the product donor, like I played that role on the client side of my previous company, I'm moving into consultant consultancy. And I was curious, like from your experience, 
do you start that conversation at the beginning of the engagement or (laughs) to find out like who is going to play this product owner role? Because to me, I feel like the product owner and like what you outlined here is very different than the executive sponsor. And like, how do you articulate that? Or do you guys have any tips, you or Terry, on like the value of that, you know, and taking that time away? And and if they don't currently have someone in that role, identifying the right person. So I can go and then Terry, if you want to, you're welcome to jump in on any of that. But um, so if we go back to that kind of that life cycle, this initiate and discover phase, this is kind of where you're putting your racy together. Um, which is the responsibility accountability, you know, chart. And that's where you are defining your product owner. So before you even start kicking off discovery, you'll have your product owner um, identified as the one person who's going to own this project going through. Your executive sponsor is typically somebody who's not going to be in the weeds. Um, the product owner's in the weeds, right? They've rolled up their sleeves. They're they're in there writing stories. They're acceptance, uh, doing the, the user... Um, like prioritization, acceptance, there that which is why I say there's so much additional time that's there. The executive sponsor typically aligns, um, at least in in my consulting company, they typically align with some of our leadership as well. So if there are, and it's projects, right? So pretty much all projects have some sort of risk or issue. That's why you do risk logs and and things from a project management perspective. So if there's ever Um, an escalation that has to take place in some way, shape or form. That's kind of when the executive comes in and um, helps work through that particular piece with the other executive alignment um, person on the the project side. That's typically how I've seen it. I don't know, Terry, if you have any additional. Um, I don't, I won't add too much, but we've got 15 minutes left. Um, so I would maybe try to see how much we can get through here to give our last presenter a little bit of time too. I totally forgot about that, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> all good. All good. Sorry, I'll run as quickly as I can. So no then, uh, as I'd also mentioned, the product owner is going through review acceptance um, uh, of stories for to complete the work and say, yep, we're good and done. Project manager. Um, I like to have project managers on both sides from a consultant perspective. So there will be a a project manager that's put on the team from the consultant um, side of things. It's great if they have one on the um, client side as well. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. It just depends on the resourcing um, that's available. But they're making sure that the methodology is being followed. They're supporting that client um, product owner in any way, shape, or form. They're basically um, the people who are removing like impediments, like blocking and tackling, trying to get things moving forward. They work on the planning. They work through, um, as I mentioned, kind of that prioritization and sprint planning. Um, They go through all those. They'll work on the budget and timeline reports. They'll be looking at the RACI. They'll look at the risk and action items log and look for any key upcoming activities um, that are put in place for that. And I think there actually is a trailhead um, specifically to a project manager and what a Salesforce project manager does. Like, and I don't know how um, how much information is needed uh, for this particular test for that, but they do have that. And then you have the rest of the delivery team who is designing, building, and testing that particular solution. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, but this is what the majority of the, the people are either solution architects, business analysts, technical architects, um, integration specialists, and data architects. Um, you also have um, some of your, your QA um, analysts that would be in here as well. Um, so again, they're working with the product owner to create and refine those user stories. That's typically a business analyst, sometimes a solution architect. Um, sometimes you have to have a technical architect or something weigh in, just depending um, on the complexity of whatever uh, item that you're trying to define throughout. Um, and then they're kind of guiding that product owner through the backlog, the prioritization, making sure that they under- he understands dependencies. If he wants to prioritize, he or she wants to prioritize one story, um, then making sure that they know and understand what the, those dependencies are after. And then um, providing expert advice, especially as items at Salesforce are starting to really go out from an industry perspective. Um, there's a lot of times that you have people who are here for industry knowledge and expertise and best practices within that specific space. Um, and then articulating any questions or um, impediments slash blockers um, to prevent progress. 
So those are really the items that I had was just kind of knowing and understanding who the key people are that are making your project go through and then um, the project life cycle overall. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, that's a lot of lot of good information. Um, I put a link in the chat there too, just so that you're familiar with what uh, Salesforce's terminology for some of that. It follows pretty closely to what you have as your life cycle on that on your initial slide. Um, it, um, but it, it tends to take more of a developer like um, application life cycle as far as some of the terms that it uses. If you scroll down, there's a little circle graph. That, oh, you'll have to sign in. Um, but take just take a look at that and be familiar with it. The definitions and everything that um that Danielle has put together they they all align it's just they're using a little bit different terms there for some of the things but this is awesome I love the detail that you had in that Danielle that's obviously something that you know and live every day so <laughs> very nicely you done. Live every day that's why I was like oh yeah <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely very nicely done all right and our last one I think Joyce was it is it is it yours with I am all right. Sales metrics, reports, and dashboards. This is a seven percent, and then we'll hit some more report snapshots next week. Those are pretty tulips. I, I was noticing a bunch of them. Tulips are all blooming around town now. It's, they are. Yeah, they look really pretty. All right. So I have sales metrics, reports, and dashboards. As Terry said, it's seven percent. Um, the um, thing here is determine the appropriate report or dashboard solutions. Uh, I will just put a disclaimer out here when I was researching this topic. It was all over the place from the sales guides. Uh, some are a little bit more down into the weeds of reports. Most of them just reference it and then create like a quick blurb on you can use Salesforce can reports. You can create your own reports and dashboards or you can use third party solutions. So to make that pretty quick, <laughs> those are kind of your three options there. Um, I will, I kind of varied about what I included in this, so a little bit of everything, uh, but I'll, I'll go through it quickly. Uh, so what is a report? It's a list of records that meet the, the criteria you define. You can filter, group, and do math, like formulas, and show charts on them. You can view reports on any data that you have access to. So if a report report uh, you create is shared out, the people who are viewing it will only see what they have access to. Okay. The way you can share them is by storing them in folders. Those folders can be public, shared, hidden, um, or set to read only or read write. Um, you can share with users, roles, roles and subordinates, and public groups. I felt like that was kind of a, one of those test questions. Mm -hmm. um, what are report types? So report types are templates that make reporting easier. When you create a report, you actually select a report type, and it determines the fields and records available when you're creating the report. So based on the relationship between the primary and related objects, you'll see those fields um, in, in included in the report that you create. You can also create custom report types. Um, and here's a little graphic of how report types uh, can be either um, not includes or includes or combination of between objects and then how they're used in reporting. Uh, you'll see dashboards and we'll talk about that in just a second. A couple of report format. This is for Lightning. I don't know if the tests still go over Classic. It shouldn't. I, I didn't think so. Uh, so with report formats for Lightning, you have uh, tabular, summary, and matrix. Um, I included some information. This is straight from Salesforce about what your use cases are. So when you want to make a list, you use tabular. Uh, charts and things like that are only when you're summarizing or using a matrix. Uh, and then same um, gives you some functionality of bucket fields. Uh, formulas can only be used when you have summary or matrix. And then you cannot do cross-object formulas on any of them. Uh, I included a list of opportunity report filters. I felt like this is very sales focused. Um, it would be good for you to know. I won't go through all of these for, for timing, um, but things like my opportunities are, are records that are owned by the person viewing the report. 
him. Something like uh, my team's opportunities would be owned by you and then users who report to you in the role hierarchy. So you can use these in the filter criteria uh, to limit or filter out really quickly based on your role hierarchy and sales team. Uh, there are also ones for account reports, very similar in regards to team, role hierarchy, territories, um, or just being all accounts. Okay, so what is a dashboard? A dashboard is a visual display of key metrics and trends. They're based on reports. They have a one-to-one -one relationship. So each dashboard con component refers to a report. But you can use multiple reports for multiple dashboards, or you can use the same report for multiple dashboard components. They do have a running user. So the security settings are based on that user. Dynamic dashboards, however, will use um, the running user that's logged in uh, by default. And then permissions are also managed by folders like reports. You can also share by role, uh, user, role and subordinates, and public groups. Uh, another little screenshot from Salesforce about component type and when to use it. I won't go over every single one of these, but there's things like sales gauges. Uh, you can set the metrics or the, the threshold. Um, or when you have uh, just like a tabular report, you'll be limited to something like these down here where it just shows the data. I think that's a really good chart to have some knowledge on on when to use what type of chart for different types of scenarios. Uh, I, I could see some questions worded around some of this type of thing. Uh, as a consultant, what type of graph would you use or component would make sense for a given type of report? Okay, so why are we using them? Uh, the foundation of a strong sales team is made up of clearly defined key performance indicators, KPIs. Uh, so the KPIs are the what and the how, um, and then using dashboards and reports to visually show the KPIs. Um, I included some of this because it reminded me of like a first meeting that we had uh, in regards to activity versus outcome. Uh, so I'll just kind of quickly go over that. These are, I thought this was a good chart just for things that they might kind of have in the, the testing about what calls are made, you know, email sent, et cetera. Um, so just kind of a, a list of those as well as outcomes. Um, so things that they might ask about in their examples. So you kind of get an idea of what they are. Um, and then in addition to that, like I said earlier, um, in addition to creating your own custom report dashboards, we're using the canned ones. Um, Salesforce has uh, Salesforce Labs on the App Exchange, and then there's a ton of third-party tools. Uh, for Salesforce Labs, they have included some like CRM dashboards, um, sales activity dashboards, and um, the, the, the opportunity accountability. This one is to track things like what opportunity is missing information, um, what hasn't been followed up in a while, uh, or haven't had activity. So this one is another one. And these are all free. Um, you can download them and then you can add customizations on top of it or change filters uh, and kind of make them your own. And then some study resources. So these are trailhead um, that I pulled information from. Uh, or their charts and all of that listed with links. So, short and sweet, <laughs> really quick. Very good. I think you covered a lot of good <laughs> good stuff there. The um, your previous slide. If you're downloading a App Exchange reports and dashboards, um, do that in a sandbox. Just a little word of advice because it creates a lot of noise that you probably mm -hmm. don't want in your production org, but there's some really, really good nuggets in some of those reports that are helpful that you can steal and borrow from. Um, the um, I think there's a lot in those as well that you can look at to get a flavor for what Salesforce is, is often recommending for types of, of reports and dashboards specifically around the concept of selling. Uh, I like things like neglected opportunities as one that I that I use frequently. 
Uh, there, that's one that I think is on one of these Salesforce App Exchange dashboards. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really good stuff. Um, I mean, the idea is to to provide information that helps your sales people be more effective and to close deals. So, a lot of different um, great resources and those App Exchange products for sure that I think can help you with as you study for this particular exam. Really good. Very good. Thank you. And any other questions for that topic? If not, uh, Brenda, you're still on and you're scheduled for next week to wrap up with reports and dashboards, uh, specifically around report, reporting snapshots. Are you good with that one? Yep, sounds good. And then Jackie, I know had to be absent today and and Julie is absent today. They will have uh, data migration and big data will be the last two topics for next week. So good job, everybody. Well done. Very good session. Um, So I'll I'll finish it like Pearl started it. It's like it's nice to be a part of a group that is all excited about this particular exam and it showed today. So thank you so much for that. Um, And we will see you next week.